So over the last almost three months now, we've been in John 1, 1 through 18. Next week would have been full three months, but we have Palm Sunday next week and we'll be in Matthew chapter 21. But we've been poring over this text together, uncovering and discovering, investigating the prologue of John's gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And to understand that this, this prologue sets up the rest of the book for us to understand what he's going to reveal to us concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ. We've discovered the pre-incarnate word who was with God in the beginning, We've discovered the incarnate word that God himself has become flesh. We've seen the witness sent, namely John. In verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And we see his faithfulness as we see that parenthesis in the chiasm of the structure of the text in verse 15. We've seen the fullness of Christ's grace and truth revealing grace upon grace to our hearts. And so as we come to this last verse of the prologue, it forms with verse 1a a literary, a literary, literary, not literally, that too, a literary envelope. In other words, there's a beginning and an end to this prologue, but yet it's bookmarked by the same thought. It brings everything within full circle, and it brings us an understanding that what John is about to do for us is to reveal the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. So in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 18, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And so we have this inclusion of, of perspective and understanding that the Word that was with God in the beginning, before time, is now being revealed to us, but yet revealed to us in such a way that He's revealing the Father. And so we have the fullness of revelation taking place in verse 18. So let's explore this together. There's a statement. It says, no one has ever seen God. Uh, That's the reality. No one. Literally, God, if we were to translate this literally, it says, God not ever has been seen. And so when the word God, Theos, is at the beginning of a Greek sentence, here the emphasis is upon him, uh, helping us to understand that this is a powerful statement. This is an emphatic statement. This is a statement when we say, no one has ever seen God. We need to say so with confidence because that's what it's sharing with us. And so in that import, in that strength of that statement, John is giving us a perspective of understanding of who and what Jesus is about to do. The reality that no one has ever seen God is important for us. Because God is holy beyond compare. God is high and lifted up and beyond what we could ever comprehend. But we may be thinking right in our hearts and minds right now, well, wait a minute. Didn't Moses see God? Didn't Moses see, see God? Well, let's, let's take a moment and go to that passage. Uh, you could read the whole section in Exodus chapter 33 and 34. But I just want to reference verse 20. God speaking, he says in verse 20 of Exodus 33, but he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. So here God is speaking a powerful word of understanding that listen, this can't happen. So that we understand that he's affirming a commonplace understanding of this truth that John is doing that in John 1. Moses does not see the Lord's face. He only sees his back. So, someone made a comment this morning during fellowship. It was so good to watch church live. And the comment went on, I saw you. And she wasn't talking about me. She was talking about Steve, because she could see the back of Steve's head and knew that Steve was in church today, last week, okay? So if she didn't have a prior relationship with Steve, she wouldn't be able to say Steve, could she? She would just say, oh, I just saw this bald head, right? It's a beautiful one. 
So, so it, well, we've got two Steves, not this Steve, that Steve. <laughs> uh, sorry, Steve, Steve. Uh, Steven, or is it Stefan? I can't remember. Um, but the point was, is that we don't identify with people from the backs of their heads, do we? Unless we're looking at a picture that we don't know who's in the picture, and we try to deduce who that is by looking at their side features or their back of their head, right? My, you couldn't recognize me in a picture from 1977 at all. Because I have a full head of hair. You couldn't recognize me. And yet, how do we think that Moses saw God? What did he see? He saw his glory passing by. He never saw the full essence of who God was because he didn't see him face to face. We could bring the same argument from Isaiah when he sees God high and lifted up. He just sees him high and lifted up. He's not in his face. He's seeing his glory all around him. And what is his response to that glory? Oh, I'm an unclean man. I don't belong here. And he confesses his inadequacy and his sin. And so Moses doesn't see the Lord's face, but only his back. And so John is giving us an understanding that God has not revealed his true self in the fullness of his glory. He may have done so anthropomorphically. You know, that's an image like a man. So we see that uh, maybe in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the man, the fourth man, who looks like the Son of Man or the Son of God. Namely, it's Christ. And when we see those types of presentations in the Old Testament, it's not God who's doing that. It's Jesus who's doing that. We can also see oftentimes there's theophanies where God is portrayed as a bright angel, a presence before his people. Or possibly when uh, Jacob wrestles with God, he's wrestling with an angel, possibly an angel, possibly Jesus himself, possibly, but yet he doesn't see fully God. And so there's this understanding of reality that the truth remains. No one has ever seen God in the fullness of who he is. But let me tell you this. There's going to be a day when we will see him not through a mirror dimly, but we will see him face to face. There will be a day that we will not have to have spectacles or special type of instruments in order to see the wonder and the majesty of who he is. We will see him face to face because we will be in his presence. But that reality helps us to put into perspective the wonder and the majesty of what John is describing for us as Jesus comes forth to be the revealer. I'd like to just help us to understand the significance of this as we bask in the, the wonder of that beautiful sunshine coming through the window. What do you see? You see light. Only as your eye can see. You can't see the full spectrum of light just by looking out that window. You can't see the full colors of it. Do you have to have a, a prism in order to refract the fullness of what's taking place in what you're seeing? There needs to be an outside influence in our lives to be able to discover that. And if you think about that for a moment, when God said, I'm going, to put a, I'm going to put a bow in the sky to remind you that I'll never do this again. Does that something that you see on a regular basis? No. It's an awe-inspiring moment, isn't it, when you see a rainbow in the sky. Everybody has to come running out of the house. Hey, look at the rainbow. Hey, look at the double. Hey, look at the triple. We get all excited about it. Why? Because it's unique. It's special. It's not commonplace. So John is helping us to understand that no one has seen God. That's the commonplace. But what he's about to help us to understand is extraordinary, supernatural presence of God being displayed. The reality, no one has ever seen God. Secondly, the revealer, the only God who is at the Father's side, the only God, that unique one. That's that same word we see in verse 14, the only Son from the Father. That same word, unique, same understanding, the only one who is God, the only Son. John picks up this theme later on in chapter 6 and verse 46. John 6, 46. 
We'll begin in verse 45. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except that he who is from God, he has seen the Father. He's the only one who has seen the Father. He's the one who's now going to be the revealer, who the one who's at the Father's side. It speaks to intimacy, mutual love, and knowledge. It's a similar word used of the beloved apostle as he reclines at Christ's breast on the Last Supper. In the bosom of the Father is a way to translate who is at the Father's side. I don't know about you who, uh, parents, maybe more so grandparents these days, are overwhelmed when your grandchild comes running to your arms and can't wait to get a hug. And then gets down, does a few toy things, and comes back for another hug. And it consistently happens throughout the whole experience of the visit. They can't get enough of hugs. Are we in that place where we're seeing Jesus is living in that intimacy of being able to rest in the Father's bosom, be at the Father's side? Not, not just the, in the sense that he's ascended to the right hand of God. He's interceding for us each day. That's true. But the reality that he is, is co-eternal with the Father, that he's intimate with the Father. As we saw uh, in verse 1, who was with God, with God, that full holy communion between the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. That intimacy and that mutual love and knowledge is emphasized. Why? Because he's the revealer. Jesus is the revealer. He is the word. He is the revealer. He is the word become flesh. He is the revealer. And so everything that we've seen in this prologue has pointing up and crescendoing unto this understanding that, hey, we understand nobody's seen God, but wait, there's someone. There's someone who can show us. We've been that way before, haven't we? Maybe not seeing God in particular, but maybe in a situation to say, uh, I don't know what to do in this situation. Who do you call? You know, you don't call Ghostbusters. You know, who do you call? You call someone you know in your life who is filled with wisdom, do you not? You call someone who's involved in your life who has maybe shared some insight and understanding with you that they've done this before. Or at least they know how to use YouTube very well. (laughs) Right? And so Jesus is that one. Jesus, as John says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. He's saying, listen, nobody's seen him, but yet I know someone. I know someone intimately. I know someone who can help us with this. Nobody's seen God, but he has. He's been in God's presence. He's the revealer. He's the one who's come in the flesh. Jesus is the revealer. So it's out of this intimacy that Jesus, the revealer, reveals the fullness of God and the fullness of revelation. No one has seen, ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. It's not a, a wishful thinking type of knowledge. Well, you'll get to understand it later on in life. You know, um, sometimes we as adults do adult things around kids. And kids hold us accountable for those naughty adult things. You know, why are you doing that? That's not good for you type of thing. Uh, And in that sense, Jesus is helping us to point to nobody's ever seen God, but I have, and I'm going to make him known. I'm going to make the privilege and the wonder and the majesty of who he is known to you. So he is, he has made him known. The he is namely the only God, the intimate one, the word become flesh, the one who was with God and is God in the beginning. He has made him known. Jesus reveals the fullness of the Father. Now, you don't have your Greek New Testaments with you this morning, right? No, oh, okay. So when you get home, look this up. Okay? You can do that easily on any type of search engine. You can get a Greek New Testament and understand your beautiful biblical Greek, coining Greek, if you want to. But the word made known is the word exegesato, from which we get exegesis. And in that sense, Jesus is the exegesis of God. Uh, he reveals the fullness. He just not, does not make him known as in, 
well, that's who he is right over there. No, he gives us the fullness of who he is. He exegetes, he displays, he brings to understanding, a greater understanding of who he is each and every day. And so when we look at John 14, uh, we like 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, right? But do we know what comes after that? John 14, verse 8. Jesus is responding to Philip as Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? I mean, he's being pretty bold there, isn't he? Then he says, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Jesus is affirming what John has said in the prologue. Listen, I'm the one. I'm the one who makes him known. I'm the one who fleshes out the fullness of who God is. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3, a similar type of perspective and understanding. Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But... In these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Does that not sound familiar to John 1.1? He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the power of, word of His power. The exact imprint. So when we see Jesus, who do we see? God. And so this revelation, the fullness of what God has done in Christ, is Jesus exegeting, living out, displaying the fullness of who he is. Commentator C.H. Dodd made some observations, and I'm not quoting him directly, I'm paraphrasing. And just listen carefully. We know from verse 4, in him was life and he was... And the life was the light of man, right? Jesus is the life. Jesus is life and is life, as we noted. Jesus raises the dead and is the resurrection. Jesus gives bread and is bread. Jesus speaks truth and is the truth. Jesus speaks the word as he is the word. You see, all these things reveal or exegete the Father in Christ for us to understand and comprehend. Uh, l- let's continue just a little rabbit trail, okay? Matthew chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. It points to his deity. It points to the significance and the power of of who he is as the Son of God. The revealer. The one who is revealing fully the majesty and the wonder of God the Father. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
You see, we often like that, go to Jesus for the help, and because it's easy, and He'll provide for us, and, and His burden is easy and light. But we fail to realize that that only comes to us because He's God. Because He's revealing the fullness of who God is, and giving us that peace and comfort. No one knows the Father except the Son. And Jesus is revealing Him to us. In John chapter 20, which we've been to a couple times already, as John summarizes the import and the power and of what he's writing. John chapter 20, in verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did, not, did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so we, we find Christ not only the one who is taking the reality that no one has ever seen God and bringing it down to the rubber meeting the road because he reveals the full revelation of who he is. If we've seen Jesus, we've seen God. Now we might ask the question this morning, wait a minute, how does this apply to us? How does this make any difference to us if we haven't seen Jesus? I beg to differ. How do we see Jesus? We see Jesus in the Word of God. We see Jesus as He dwells within us in the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We see Jesus in the hearts and lives that have been transformed for the kingdom of God as He's touched you and brought you into a saving relationship with Jesus. We see Him. He's revealed the fullness of God to us. I, I also want us to see a, a, a big contrast or a powerful illustration to help us to keep this all in perspective. Let's go to 1 Kings. Samuel, Kings. Verse and Second Samuel, 1 Kings, chapter 8, and verse 12. And then we're going to go to nine, Psalm 97 and verse 2. Then Solomon said, 1 Kings 8, 12, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. Thick darkness. Okay? Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and thick darkness all, are all around him. Okay? So that sets us up to realize that nobody's ever seen God because he's dwelling in his thick darkness, right? Now let's turn to the New Testament. 1 Peter, verse 2, verse 9. I mean, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So we now, if you will, dwell in that presence of God. He's no longer dwelling in darkness, secluded or isolated from us. We're dwelling in that light with Him because we have been chosen to be part of that. Let's go back to Exodus. Exodus 33, where we were earlier. 33 and 4, four that encounter. But in verse 18, Moses said, Lord, please show me your glory. And we know the rest of the story. That he said, you can't see me face to face, right? But yet, we now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Sorry, we're running all over the place, all right? So you're, you're all your achy hands from your arthritis are getting a workout this morning. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, as we noted last week, that the law points our sin out, but that the law in the Old Testament also points Jesus out. 
So even though there may be darkness, even though there may be things that we don't see the full glory of God, but in Jesus we do. In Christ we do. And so we live in a privileged time of understanding that perspective, that when John says, now no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. And what should our response be? Our response should be is to listen to His words with awe and wonder. We're not just talking about New Testament words, words when we talk about Jesus. You know, when you get a red-letter Bible, you are, you're missing out. Why? Because technically, the whole book should be read. And I'm not talking about reading. I'm talking about red as in color, because Jesus is the Word of God. Is he not? The fullness of this book should be read. Not just those special places in the Gospels. Listen to his words with awe and wonder. Secondly, obey his words with fullness, with the fullness of our hearts. It's, it's one thing just to listen and get awe-inspired, but if we're not going to put it into application and live it out daily, we are finding ourselves short-lived and short-handed concerning the majesty and the wonder of his word. And not only listen, not only obey, but give Him the glory and honor do His name, the Word become flesh. So, I gave you a word. L-O-G. Log. Listen. Obey. Give. Or glorify. Easy. You get a wood stove at home? What do you put in it? A stick of wood? No, you've got to put logs on the fire, right? Every time you think of a log, listen, obey, glorify. The most significant response that we could give is not only those three things, but more importantly, to believe on Him as our Lord and Savior. To believe that He is God in the flesh. To believe that he gave himself up for us. And the fullness as this whole text is enveloped for us this morning, bookended with the majesty and the glory and the wonder of knowing God. Jesus laid down his life for you and me so that we could have eternal life. And we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper in a moment to prepare our hearts to give praise to Him and to remember Him and to give thanks to Him. Amen.